Sometimes people look at prayer as a passive activity. There is nothing more active than prayer. Prayer is an active participation by the child of God as he comes before the throne, humbly asking God to do great and mighty things. So, as we uh, think this morning and where we've been in the book of Colossians, uh, we know that Jesus is Lord and He must be preeminent. That's one of the things that we've learned. The second thing that we learned is that uh, we've learned about what it means to be alive in Christ and uh, what it means, how that looks to, to uh, put to death the deeds of the flesh and to put on Christ. And we found that first and foremost, uh, we should seek the things above. And in doing that, in seeking the things above and making that our uh, particular focus, uh, some may misunderstand and think that seeking the things above somehow means that we disregard and uh, we, uh, we ignore the world around us. Uh, it's commonly said, and I know that you've heard it said, and I've probably even said it from this pulpit, that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Where did that come from? Where is that thought found? Uh, it's found in Jesus' upper room discourse in so many words, John 14, 15, 16, and 17, where he met with the disciples and he prayed to the Father. Uh, he, he began that prayer in John 17, 14, and here's what he says. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they, us, are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So in those three verses, Jesus said twice, they, or we, are not of the world. So as we seek the things above, that may cause us, and it does cause some groups, to disengage and disregard the world. But that is not exactly what Jesus is saying. Because the very next verse, verse 18 of John 17, says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So to be in the world but not of the world is not to disengage or disregard the world. It's to be a, be a part of the world and to affect the world for the glory of God. And that's what Paul is going to talk about today in the book of Colossians. Uh, we have seen that seeking the things above last week meant putting Christ first in our marriage, putting Christ first in our family, and putting Christ first in our work. He is the Lord. And as Paul concludes uh, the, this uh, marvelous book, he is going to exhort the Colossians, and thereby he's going to exhort us this morning in, how, in, in uh, instructing us how to pray uh, and how to relate to lost people in the world because we are supposed to be sent into the world. So if you have your Bibles, I trust that you do. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the world to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make, make, make it known as I should. Act wisely toward outsiders. Make the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. So as we think about those uh, few verses this morning, what we want to consider is this. We must pray for the gospel to increase and that our lives light the way. 
pray for the gospel to increase and that our lives light the way. That's not simply an admonition for each of us individually, even though it is. That's an admonition for us as a church to pray for the gospel to increase and that our lives light the way. So he's going to talk in this passage about persevering in prayer. And so if we are to persevere, not just in prayer, but if we are to persevere in life, uh, there must be two, three, two things that are true. First, our commitment to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. And in this passage today, we're going to find that out that it will be a commitment to prayer along with the Word of God, that will allow us to persevere in this world. So the first uh, point is this. Pray with your eyes wide open. That's found in verses 2, 3, and 4. We're not talking about posture, per se. Uh, uh, we're not talking about whether your eyes are really open or really closed, or uh, whether you're kneeling, standing up, uh, laying down before the Lord uh, with your face to the ground. Uh, we're not talking about posture as much as we are our attitude to the Lord uh, when we pray to Him and we seek Him. Now, both of these sections are going to follow the same basic pattern. There's a command in each one of these sections. He's going to tell us, how we are to fulfill that command, and in what manner uh, we fulfill that command. And then he will tell us the purpose behind that, uh, and he will also show us the result of that. And so pray with your eyes wide open. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. So he's asking them to pray to a certain end. Now the command in this little section, 2, 3, and 4, is simply that one word there, devote. That is the command. That is the imperative. That is what God wants us to do, to devote ourselves to prayer, to persevere in prayer. Uh, that calls for not just simply occasional prayers. Uh, that is not simply a call to pray to God in times of crisis. That's not a call to pray to God as the Pharisees repetitively and in the same way. It's a heartfelt cry to God, speaking to Him, having a conversation with the Lord. As we persevere in prayer, we will two things are going to happen. We will grow closer to God, and secondly, we will gladly receive the answer that He gives. And the answer that He gives may not be the answer that we first went to him for. But the more we persevere, the more we will be in tune with what God's desire is for our life. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Be alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. So as we devote ourselves to God in prayer... How are we to do that? Uh, he spells that out in verse 2, the latter half. Stay alert in it. Uh, your Bible may say, being vigilant. Uh, I think of Gideon. You remember the story of Gideon? Uh, where we've just began in my Sunday school class to go through the book of Judges. Uh, one of the stories that we will encounter is the story of Gideon. You remember how God chose his warriors? He chose his warriors because instead of drinking water like most people drink water, they lapped it like a dog. In other words, as they quenched their thirst, they were watchful for the enemy. 
And God only chose 300 of them to fight all the host of the Midianites. Nehemiah speaks about this same thing in Nehemiah 4, 9. So we prayed to our God and stationed a guard because of them day and night. So they were literally watching and praying, being vigilant, persevering in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Routine prayers are unanswered prayers. Let me repeat myself. Routine prayers are unanswered prayers. He tells us to be vigilant, and he also says in regards to the vigilant prayer that we are offering to God, that this prayer, this spiritual wakefulness, is accompanied by thanksgiving. To be sure, one of the, the great characteristics of a Christian life is love, right? Well, it can also be said one of the great characteristics of a Christian life is thanksgiving. There is really no such thing as a sour Christian. There is no such thing as a bitter Christian. We are to be a thankful people. We have most to be thankful for. God has redeemed us. He has saved us from our sin. He has put us on the right path. He has given us the word of God. He has filled us with the Spirit he has made us a part of his church. We can come to him in prayer at any time. He spoke to this earlier in the book of Colossians. If you go back to chapter 3, beginning there with verse 15. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with thankfulness. In your hearts, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Vigilant prayer in thanksgiving. And what would be the purpose of that? The purpose of that, he's going to ask the Colossians to pray for an open door. To pray for an open door for the word of God to go forth. So when we pray, point, principle here, specificity is always better than generality. If I could compare it to an arms, uh, a, a weapon uh, illustration, prayer is much better akin to a rifle than it is a shotgun. We need to zero in on what we need to pray for. Paul asked for an open door for the word. If you look there at verse 3, he says this. Here's what I want you to pray for, Colossians. Here's what I want you to pray for, Southside. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word. To speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. He actually is going to give two purposes. The first one is what we just read. An open door for the word. What is the word? It's the mystery of the gospel. For which Paul says, that's the very reason I am in chains. What is the mystery? Go back with me to chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Chapter 2, verse 2. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love. 
so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. That's the open door. To have an open door for the Word of God, which is the mystery of Christ, which is Christ. So that's what we want to pray for here at Southside. It may be in a church service like this, praying for an open door. It may be in VBS, praying for open doors so that God's word would go forth and the mystery of Christ would be revealed to people so that the hope that is in us, Christ, could also be the hope that could be in them, Christ, the hope of glory. But you notice a second purpose he alludes to there in verse 4, not alludes to, verse 4, so that, purpose clause, so that... I may make it known as I should. It's one thing to pray for an open door. It's another thing to take the open door that you've been given, either to walk through it or to present. And so he gives us the purpose of his imprisonment. He is in chains for the sake of the mystery of Christ. That's not the purpose the Romans have him in chains. But he understands the will of God. And he understands that God has put him there in jail for the purpose of the sake of the mystery of Christ. So that he will make it known. See, he understands as he prays, and this must be our approach as well, we approach prayer with much humility. Because we know we are weak and frail. And Paul says, I'm asking you to pray for an open door, but I know that my tendency is not to do that. So I am praying, verse 4, that I may make it known as I should. Because it may be my tendency to not capitalize on the opportunities that I have been given. What he is telling us is the message. The message is of utmost priority. <laughs> you will notice, th this may revitalize prayer requests on a whole another level, right? Notice, he does not pray for prison doors to be open. He does not pray for shackles to fall. He prays that God would allow him to do what he has put him there to do. The message is the most important thing. And the power of gospel proclamation is the prayer, as Barb said earlier, the prayer that precedes it. We're asking the God, for God to go before us. Spurgeon, whenever he would... Uh, do a, a tour of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, which was kind of the se seventh wonder of the world of its day. He was, a, he was a large church pastor before there ever was such thing as a mega church. And as he would go through the Metropolitan Tabernacle, he would make his way down to the basement. Boilers, all sorts of filth, and a bunch of chairs. And they would say, well, why did you bring us down here? And what he would say is, well, this is the church's powerhouse. And then all the people would look around at the bowlers and they would think, well, this is where the heat comes from and, and this is how the, the church is uh, heated during the winter. Well, that's not what he was talking about. What he was talking about is 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days out of the year, people gathered in the basement of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and they would pray. They even met there when Spurgeon was preaching. And when Spurgeon, it just so happens that the pulpit was above the basement and the powerhouse. And if Spurgeon felt weak in the pulpit, and if Spurgeon ever felt the spirit ebbing, what he would do was he would stomp on the floor, and what that meant was, people, y'all need to turn it up another notch. Y'all need to start seriously praying, because I'm not feeling the Spirit the way that I should. 
persevering in prayer. It is our powerhouse. Some have said to me, well, you know, prayer, it's the least that I can do. No, it's the most that you can do. Prayer is the most that we can do. Our prayers are to be faithful, watchful, thankful, and purposeful. It is interesting that he says, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Let me see if I can illustrate. <laughs> I stand before you today, uh, a man that my, my heart's kind of breaking this morning. My son is preaching today in Bowling Green, Kentucky. He's preaching in view of a call. Now, there's a part of me that says, well, my grandchildren are going to be 11 hours away from me. My son is going to be 11 hours away from me. He's never been that far away from me. But I gladly ask the Lord to open this door because I know this. Instead of speaking to hundreds of people, Jeremy will have the opportunity to speak to thousands of people. An open door. Now that's at my demise, but that's for the furtherance of the gospel of the kingdom. And so I gladly relinquish my rights for the advancement of the gospel. See, that's what Paul is calling each and every one of us to do. To, to pray that God would open a door for the word to go forth. Now, that being said, that may cost us. And that may cost you. It may cost you time. It may cost you talent. It may cost you money. It may cost you sacrifice. It may cost you all sorts of things. But God's kingdom is worth it. And so, we are not just praying for the gospel to increase. We are praying that our lives would light the way. Our lives would light the way. So, we live our life as a light to the world. So, in doing so, Paul is going to show us our walk before lost people and our conversation before lost people. And so, they're beginning with verse 5. Act wisely toward outsiders. Make the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. So, here's the command. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Literally, Walk in wisdom toward unbelievers. Walk in wisdom toward unbelievers. Or, or act in wisdom toward unbelievers. Your, your walk is your way of life. It's your manner of, of living. Uh, and so we are commanded to act wisely before lost people. It's not the first time that we've seen this in this book. Go back to chapter 1, verse 10. So that you may... Walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. How are we to do that? He's going to tell us two things. Uh, the first thing in regard to how our walk should be, our walk should have a sense of urgency about it. He says there in verse 5, we are to act wisely toward unbelievers, making the most of the time. Time is a precious commodity. And so uh, your Bible even may say this, this way. Redeem the time. Uh, the opportunity is there. And so you make the most of it. 
What Paul is telling us is, in, in regard to him, every moment of his life was devoted to the gospel. So, I must redeem every single opportunity and open door that I have. My mother was a, uh, uh, she was peculiar in some ways. She would, I guess it's because she was born in the Great Depression. But she would wait uh, with anticipation every week for the circlers that would come. Circlers. That would be uh, things from Brookshire's or things from whatever, Mark. Circlers. And then she would always uh, clip her coupons. Because, uh, and it's not that they were, that didn't have the wherewithal to, to buy groceries. But that's just the way that she was. And I'm telling you, and she's my witness. When it came grocery buying day, she would go to Brookshire's, she would go to Walmart, she would go to Super One, she would go to Piggly Wiggly. She would go to everything in town to get everything that was on sale because she knew this. Them circlers was going to run out and there was only a short window that you had to redeem your coupons. Well, in regard to the gospel, that window is going to run out. And there's just a short window. And we have to redeem our time and use it wisely in what we have been given. Every moment <laughs> devoted to the gospel. So that's our walk. But he also tells us how our talk should be before unbelievers. Our speech should be seasoned with grace. Uh, he uses the word there, uh, salt, uh, seasoned with salt. And immediately we might think, well, the words of Jesus. You are the, you are the light of the world and uh, a city on a hill and you are the salt of of the earth. And, and what good is salt if it's not used? It's just to be thrown out and trampled under foot of men. And so when Jesus said it, what he was hinting at most of all was that salt is a preservative. We, we are a preservative in this world. But what Paul is hinting at is not the preservative aspect of salt. What Paul is hinting at is the taste effect of salt. Uh, he says that our speech should be gracious and it should be seasoned with salt. So salt, I'm not a fan of salt, by the way. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But salt, I hear tell, I don't believe it, but salt, I hear tell, is supposed to enhance the flavor. My father was also kind of odd uh, he puts salt on all sorts of stuff that I don't think salt belongs. Salt on watermelon. Who ever heard of that? That's just ridiculous. No, that's ridiculous. Son, it makes the watermelon taste better. No, it doesn't. It makes it taste salty. But nonetheless, salt is supposed to add taste. And so what is he telling us? What he is telling us is that our conversation before the lost people of the world is supposed to be inviting. We are supposed to talk in such a way that it is supposed to draw people to the faith. The words that we use are important. And he says they are supposed to be seasoned with salt. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. And so he doesn't give us a purpose, but he does give us a result here. He says, so that you may know how you should answer each 
person. Well, what are the people that he's talking to? Well, here in Colossae, he's talking to the legalist. He's talking to those that value experience over truth. He's talking to those that are somehow ascetic or have this high spiritual plane that they're living in. And then he's talking to the lost. So our speech is important. Every believer needs to know how to bear witness to the gospel. Let me just, we're close to VBS, so just let me give it to you here real easily. A, you, you want to lead somebody to faith. A, admit to God you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. C, confess your faith in him as Lord. There it is. That's A, B, C. That we should all be able on some level to share our faith. Every believer will know how uh, to do so when their conduct is lived how. Look back at the first verse we looked at. Or, excuse me, verse 5. Act wisely. Wisely. That's skillfully. That's how we live. Our character, conduct, and conversation is to be like Christ. So we must pray for the gospel to increase and our lives to light the way. 1806. A young man by the name of Samuel Mills. He's a freshman at Williams College. He had been reading William Carey's Inquiry. The, the title of that book, uh, pamphlet, is about that long, but it had to do with an inquiry into the investigation of winning the heathen to Christ. And he was talking about going to Burma, and he was talking about going to to uh, India, and uh, Samuel had been reading that with five of his friends, and they were on their way back home, and a, a thunderstorm occurred, and there was much lightning, much wind, much rain, and they found uh, shelter within a large group of haystacks. There, sheltered in the wind, they began to pray, and they began to pray about what they had read. And they began to pray about India, and they began to pray about Africa, and they began to pray about Burma, and they began to pray about all these different nations. And then at the conclusion of that prayer meeting, he looked at the four boys that were with him, and he uttered these words. We can do it if we will. That's all he said. We can do it if we will. Those five gentlemen started four or five different missionary sending agencies. One of those, uh, two of the men that were missionaries of one of those agencies was Adoniram Judson, Southern Baptist, Luther Rice, who was one of the founders of the Southern Baptist Convention. There, at is what is called the Haystack Prayer Meeting, they found the Lord and they began to pray to him fervently. And God did wonderful things. Sometimes people look at prayer as a passive activity. There is nothing more active than prayer. Prayer is an active participation by the child of God as he comes before the throne, humbly asking God to do great and mighty things. That's what we're asking. For God to open a door for the gospel and for us to take the opportunity when those are given to us, redeeming the time. So, what shall we do? Here's what we shall do. Respond to God's call to pray for gospel opportunities for ourselves and for our church. I'm going to lead us in that prayer in just a second. Pray that we will present the gospel message clearly and boldly. Third, pray that we will present the gospel message in a way accessible to those who hear. Now, I'm pretty confident that I'm preaching to the choir this morning. I'm, I'm pretty confident this is the faithful. But just in case there are or is someone here that does not know the Lord, you can cry out to the Lord today to ask him to save you. Psalm 145, he says this. It's a prayer of David. The Lord is near 
all who call out to him. All who call out to him with integrity. If you ask the Lord and you mean it to save you, you know what? He will save you. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and he saves them. The Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. As you, pray, as you bow, you pray along with me. I'll pray out loud. You just pray in your heart for each of these. The first one, respond to God's call to pray for gospel opportunities for ourselves and for our church. Lord, we come to you humbly, and yet you told us to come boldly before your throne. And Lord, we ask that you would open doors for your word to go forth. Lord, I pray that when we see these doors, Lord, that we won't hesitate, but we will walk through, participate in, counting the cost. Lord, I pray that we will present the gospel message clearly and boldly every opportunity that we get. Even if that means A, admit to God you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. C, confess your faith in Him. And Father, I pray that we will present the gospel message. Seasoning what we say with salt. Redeeming the time so that it will be appealing to the lost. God, I pray again that we will not hesitate. Lord, I pray that we will not equivocate. Lord, I pray that we will participate in every way possible. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in this church. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need a move of God. We need the Spirit of God to fall fresh on us. And Lord, we don't want to wait for a meeting. Lord, we want you to do that right now. For your name's sake, honor and glory. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.